All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise uh, Institute. Welcome to our event on Belgium's road to recovery. Um, I am delighted to be to be joined today by Thomas Dermin, who is uh, uh, Secretary of State for the Recovery Plan uh, uh, for Strategic Investments and uh, Science Policy of the Kingdom of Belgium. Uh, we're going to talk a bit first about the uh, sort of general public health environment, macro environment in Belgium and Europe as it has evolved over the past year. We'll then turn to the uh, way in which European policy has evolved over the crisis, especially where it comes to fiscal policy and to uh, providing support to member states, uh, in particular in the form of the recovery and uh, resilience facility. Uh, and we'll then spend quite a bit of time talking about the specific implementation of the uh, recovery um, facility in Belgium, about Belgium's uh, recovery uh, plan with which uh, uh, Thomas has been heavily involved. Uh, and we'll then talk more about issues of implementation, financing, coordination across layers of government and the like. And so a big focus of our conversation today will really be about, you know, what does the, uh, you know, new European recovery and resilience facility look like in practice? And so with that, uh, uh, Thomas, well, uh, thank you for, for joining me today. Uh, I am uh, excited to have this conversation. Can you bring our, uh, our listeners and viewers who are uh, overwhelming in the, overwhelmingly in the United States, can you bring them up to speed a bit on how, what the crisis has looked like in Belgium, uh, how the pandemic has evolved, uh, and, and what the, maybe what the macro picture looks like uh, as well? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you. Thanks, uh, Stan, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and share with uh, American colleagues our experience in Europe. So um, in, in Belgium, uh, I must say that we have been uh, hit hard uh, by the coronavirus uh, during the first wave in the spring of 2020. Uh, as you may have read, Belgium was one of the heaviest hit country um, in the first wave. Uh, then we had a very uh, long uh, second wave during the winter uh, of 2020 uh, 20 and, and spring this year. Um, we are uh, currently uh, opening up uh, again the economy with the restaurants and the bar uh, who have been opened uh, since last week. And, and if you know uh, all about the Belgian beers, you know that bars being open in Belgium is always a big uh, event. Um, and in terms of vaccination, we are at around 50%, 40, 45% of the population vaccinated. And we hope to be uh, fully uh, with uh, some kind of collective immunity by the end of the, of the summer to have uh, a fully reopened economy uh, by uh, the end of the summer. Uh, Belgium, uh, as, uh, as many other European states, um, has implemented very strong mechanism to support the private sector through the crisis. Uh, through uh, an employment, uh, specific unemployment benefits, both for uh, the employees and the independent workers. Uh, and so, so far, we live a bit in a, in a kind of an artificial situation where the, um, uh, the statistics on the job market are pretty much stable and, and where the level of, uh, of companies going into bankruptcies has been quite uh, limited. And now the big question we're facing is whether um, we will have uh, basically in the coming months when we will gradually shut down those general mechanisms of support to the private sector when we will if we will have uh, a massive impact on the job market and on the on the bankruptcy level and um, especially in, in in specific industries that have been um, uh, affected uh, uh, mostly by uh, the pandemic and, and and the consequences of the of the, of the lockdown so this is a bit the the situation i would say today it's a bit a mix of um, um, a lot of joy because uh, everything is going to be open again and, and we've been in this lockdown for the last six months, but also uh, a, a, a lot of worry and uncertainty about uh, what will be the real consequences as we've been in this kind of uh, artificial economic situation where uh, massive public support has, has supported uh, deficiencies in the private sector. So how... How industry, how industry specific was the was that public support? Was it really oriented toward the industries that were hardest hit? Was it more across the board? Um, I think because that will matter a lot too as you phase out, right? Because if you if you were providing support to to, to everyone, presumably industries that were functioning fine will 
will have built up a sort of an excess capacity of firms that that would normally have gone under even in normal times. So. Yeah, and that's 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 yeah. that's precisely the question we ask ourselves is that we've been, and if I compare to the U.S. and I, I, I mean, we've been pretty general in the in in the uh, in the benefit schemes that that we have designed in order to be extremely uh, reactive uh, and so on. Uh, so indeed, there may have been some kind of um, of of too broad effect uh, on, on on the way we design the uh, the uh, the support uh, mechanism, and that's actually the reason why. Uh, nor we we are wondering what will be the the consequences as we uh, phase out uh, this mechanism and and we are currently working on how can we uh, as we phase out those uh, general mechanism uh, phasing new support mechanism for industries that have been uh, uh, affected uh, very deeply by the crisis or we will suffer from uh, long standing effect of the of the of the covid or a slow uh, a slower uh, recovery in order to to uh, minimize those uh, structural impacts uh, of the of the crisis on, on our economy. And so how worried are you? Because with that, you might see an, a labor market impact too, right? I think Belgium Belgium's labor market has held up quite well, I think, with unemployment rates not really going up much. Uh, is, is, that a, is that a particular source of concern? Uh, indeed, especially, um, I mean, Belgium, and I think it's been, it, is, it has been documented, has been through the crisis with one of the job markets who has been the, the most stable uh, in Europe. And this is, I mean, this is due uh, in part of the, of the, of the, of the, the, the width of the, of the general mechanism that we have um, designed during the crisis. Um, and, and now, indeed, uh, uh, what we start to see is that firms uh, may have deferred uh, some uh, uh, restru- restructuring activities, etc. But there is a, a likelihood that this will accelerate in the next few months. Hence, the need to, uh, to 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 provide further support and to make sure we 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 design specific schemes to 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 retrain and and, and ensure that those people in those industries will be uh, transferred in other uh, sectors. And so, one source of funding and uh, maybe maybe inspiration for for those kinds of programs. Uh, will will presumably come from different elements of the of the recovery plan uh, that is going to be our main focus today. Can you so for for the audience here? Can you give us a bit of background on how the recovery facility came to be? How 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 new this really is for the for the European Union, uh, uh, of which you, by the way, have a flag behind you for people who aren't recognizing it. Um, how so? How did that come to be? How what what is the uh, what, what really was the the motivation for the member states to to establish the recovery facility? Can you can you walk us through that a little bit? And this goes back to last summer, of course. Uh, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, and I I believe that especially for Americans' colleagues, um, you may underestimate the, the 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 real significance of what's happening in Europe right now with uh, what we call the um, uh, next generation fund, the uh, recovery and resilience uh, uh, mechanism, because it's one of the, uh, it's the first time in in, in the European history that actually uh, the European uh, Union has raised uh, its own uh, financial instruments. So we have an experience in in Europe with um, uh, solidarity between member states with what we call structural funds, so funds who are basically granted by Europe to uh, regions or countries who, who, who need economic support. But those structural funds uh, basically are based on, on membership fees paid by the member state to the European Union. Now it's the first time uh, in history uh, that Europe is basically raising its own financial instruments. So I believe that what we what we often say in, in Europe is that the Europe, European Union is now experiencing it's uh, a Hamiltonian moment, uh, exactly the same way uh, in, in the US uh, uh, during the presidency of, of Hamilton, uh, you made a great uh, step forward in, in the integration of the, of the union. And, and that's, I mean, that's it's still very much unknown, but we may uh, be experiencing such a moment in, in, in Europe. And it has a lot of, um, of consequences. For example, in our uh, recovery plan, each member state has to submit a few uh, investment projects, uh, but each member state has also the duty to submit um, a, a set of reforms, and, and those reforms are reforms uh, formulated by the uh, European Commission 
within the framework of the European semester. So this kind of B annual review, a policy review that the commission uh, is sending to the member states. And, and usually what we used to say is that the European Union is, is, is the European Commission is a bit of a, a, dog's, a dog that barks, uh, but does not bite. And, and, and for the first time, actually, we have a dog who actually can uh, uh, also uh, bite because if you don't comply with the reform agenda of the union, you may face a risk of not receiving uh, the investment grants uh, from the union. So the relationship with the European Commission is also uh, very much uh, changing. And so the the uh, so first to, to put this into perspective a little bit. Normally the the EU budget is about one percent of of union wide GDP. The uh, the money that's going to be made available now through the uh, next generation EU slash recovery uh, fund is about three to 4% of GDP, right? So it really is a, a significant amount of, of money. I mean, spread out over a few years, but it really is a, a, a qualitative expansion of the, the, the size of the central fiscal capacity. So the, I think that that conditionality point is interesting, right? Because it really is a, a move away from, you know, you you sent money to Brussels and it goes to structural funds and it gets redistributed a little bit, but ultimately decisions are very much made at the national level to a situation that, uh, you know, I think if you if you want to portray it negatively, you say this is a bit like the way in which the IMF provides funding, right, where you have a reform agenda and you have to comply with that, otherwise you don't get access to the fund funds. I think if you want to Give it a little more political legitimacy. You would say this is what the U.S. does do, right? If you if you don't uh, comply with certain rules and regulations, you don't get your highway funds. Uh, yeah, but again, so- I, think, I think as you said, it, it raises a lot of questions depending on how you see the situation. The negative yeah. way to see it is it indeed the relationship between the IMF and, the, and 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 the different countries around the world. The positive way to see it is actually it's a first step into further European integration. But it raises indeed the question of uh, political le- legitimacy, and and if you want to move on with such a, a, a way of working, then you have to redesign uh, some uh, uh, legislative and, and, and some uh, democratic mechanism to ensure that you have uh, the, the right uh, uh, legitimate ways to, to, to deal with this kind of decision. And do you think that, that, do you think that is happening? Do you think, what, how, do you, how do you see that? How does the Belgian government, because, because there, obviously there are pretty stark divisions of, of views on that I think across member states, uh, yeah, even between Belgium and the Netherlands, I think, uh, you know, sure. even, yeah. Um, but so, what, as part of a broader agenda, how do you how do you see that? Do you think it would require strengthening the role of the parliament? What's the? I think we we will learn a lot from the experience, and, and I don't see any change in the coming uh, in in the short in the very short term. Um, I think, indeed, as you said, I mean, uh, Belgium has a long tradition of being a country. As, as the host country of the institution, as a country who has been a founding member of the EU, uh, we have a very uh, pro-Europe uh, 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 population, uh, which is increasingly not the case in, in, in certain member states. Uh, and you've seen that actually also with this uh, 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 recovery and resilience fund, you have a lot of uh, concern in certain uh, states, especially on the capability of each state uh, in the union to absorb uh, important uh, investment plan. If you look at some countries, uh, especially in the southern part or the eastern part of Europe, they will have uh, 10, 15, 20 percent of the GDP to absorb in investment projects, with countries who sometimes lack the execution capabilities to deliver on, on, on those kind of plans. So those are, are concerns that, that will need to be addressed because in the end, it's a decision. I mean, the, the decision to validate the national plans w- will be taken by the AU Council uh, this summer. So it needs to be a, a decision shared by uh, all the member states. And, and that is a the unanimity is required there. How does that how is that going to work? Is that plan by plan and there's a vote? That seems tricky. It's <laughs> as you as you as you know it's, it's as you may guess it's the big it's the big it's the big discussion right now so how, because some member states have already notified that they won't be able to submit the plan by uh, the end of the deadline uh, it's the case for example for the Netherlands who, who have a new uh, a new government since very recently so they have not been able to submit the plan but but that's a bit the question i mean who uh, 
will it be one batch with all the plants? Uh, will there be exceptions? Uh, and how will this exactly happen? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big question, and I'm I'm very happy I'm not involved in making this decision. I, for our for our viewers, I, if you're if you're interested in the in this new Dutch government, I hosted a, a webinar on the Dutch elections um, when they happened, and now about three months ago, uh, and I think our discussion then foreshadowed the government that is going to that is likely to be formed. Uh, they're still in the process of, of forming that government, but it you know there's some some political complications, and so now part of the discussion is should we first write a recovery plan before we form the new governing coalition? And so that, that of course, raises its own issues of democratic legitimacy where you don't, right, where you, you, you write the uh, recovery plan without a really democratically accountable uh, cabinet being in place. And so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but that, that is uh, an update on that, on that event. So, uh, and, and while, I, while I'm on that topic, let me, uh, also uh, announced and next week I'm doing an event with uh, a, the uh, Swedish State Secretary of the Treasury. And that's another country that that really is a counterpoint, I think, to to countries like Italy, where really the funding is a massive share of GDP. Right in Sweden, it's it's, uh, you know, a, a, as small a share of GDP as it can be. And you'll 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 know, see and, that. And the worst yeah. the worst example you have is, is indeed for. For each of the member states, you have a different balance between the, the, the carrot and the stick. So the carrot is the investment plan, the yeah. investment amount you, you 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 get, and the stick is basically the reforms you need to pass. And for for some countries, uh, you have a good balance. Honestly, for Belgium, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good balance. Um, but from countries, for example, if you take Luxembourg, they will receive, I believe, a few a few fifty million of something uh, as 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 in as investment uh, uh, grants. But uh, the counterpart they have to do as reform is to revise their uh, tax system and so on. And, and, and we know that basically the entire business model of the country is based on this. And so the conversation we had was basically, hey, I'm not going to screw my entire country business model for 50 million of investment. And, and right. the additional complexity you have is that, uh, of course, each member state has a different uh, uh, agenda in terms of uh, elections. And so if you look at very big countries uh, like France or like Germany, uh, they're going to vote this year uh, for Germany um, and next year in spring for France. So the likelihood that you're able to pass significant reforms or to take commitment on significant reforms, uh, given the fact that you have uh, an electoral term in, in, in the very near future is, is, is somehow uh, diminished. So this is also a very important concern to take into account. Yeah, that's the. It's a challenge of, of trying to synchronize things at the, at the union-wide level, while while national political cycles are not are not synchronized, right? That, that's that's obvious. Yeah, here in the U.S., of yeah. course, it's a little more, uh, in line. So, before we we go to, uh, Belgium specifically, one thing I wanted to ask you is the current EU presidency was reasonably heavily focused on the European Union social pillar, uh, and. Uh, can you talk a bit about what the relationship is between that pillar, what it is supposed to do, and these recovery plans? How how those elements of the the sort of Europe wide agenda how they how they come together? Yeah. So so the the the, the assignments uh, we receive from the European Union was basically to to design um, uh, investment plans. Uh, 750 uh, billions uh, were raised at the uh, European level, roughly uh, 50% uh, accessible through uh, loans and 50% uh, via uh, grants. Uh, what's uh, uh, striking is that nearly no uh, member state has called upon the loans uh, because actually the, the funding condition for the member states uh, are so good uh, currently that the incentives to go through the union to get the loans is very uh, is, is very low is very low the amount uh, which has been granted to each uh, member state uh, is uh, computed uh, based on uh, an allocation key uh, which is um, a function of uh, i would say economic development but also how deep the impact of the covid has been and that's how basically Germany gets uh, an amount which is twice as small as the amount for, for Italy uh, because it was less impacted and because the, uh, the difference with the European average is, is, is bigger. 
Um, so we design uh, in the design of, 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 of this investment plan, given the amount that you have received for um, the uh, from the EU. Of course, you have a first challenge, which is basically in Belgium, how do you split this amount between the different uh, regions in Belgium? And you know that Belgium is a very specific uh, institutional system. Uh, but then the guidelines we received from the EU were quite limited, actually. Uh, the focus of this plan is working on the twin, twin transition, so the digital transition and the green transition. So we had minimal amount uh, to commit to those uh, two uh, very broad policy objectives. 37% uh, for the green part, 20% for the digital part. Uh, but so we should, but, but so we should see it quite separately from the the social pillar objectives of of labor labor force participation and and those kinds of things. Those are not those are not explicitly tied to the. No, but but then in the way you design it, basically uh, the way we worked on it is that for the reminder, so we have a commitment for uh, 57%, but we still 43% where we can do uh, we have more flexibility. And there you see in a lot of member states, uh, it's the case in Germany, in France, in, in, in Belgium for the plan I know uh, best, you, you have a lot of social uh, policy program, uh, uh, social infrastructure, training programs, labor programs, but also in your own digital programs or green programs, you can have a, a very social angle. I mean, if you uh, renovate uh, social buildings to make them more energy efficiency, uh, it's a green policy, but it's also a very socially pro pro progressive uh, policy. And the same, in the same way, a lot of the, the, the digital funds are, um, are granted to basically anticipate the impact of digital technologies on the job market and, 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 the, and the kind of future of work uh, type of, of programs. And this is, of course, very socially, prog socially progressive, but also uh, uh, can be tagged uh, as a digital program. So now may be a good moment to actually delve a little deeper into the into the the plan as 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 as, as you've composed it. Uh, I believe you have a couple of slides that I think now may be a good moment to yeah for to sure share. Um, I think I you will should be able to... share my screen with you. Very good. And tell me if you if you can see it. Oh yes. All right. Um, so basically, let me take it from the beginning. All right. So. Our plan in Belgium is structured alongside five dimensions, which um, basically um, are the five structural ch changes that, that Belgium needs to address. The first one is the environment and how do we uh, make sure we comply with the 2030 uh, target of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the second aspect is, of course, around uh, digital, with the big question of how do we anticipate the change that digital technologies will have on our uh, economy. Um, the Third one is the, the, the yellow one is, is, is mobility. Uh, and, and if you've been to Belgium, you know that Belgium uh, and specifically Brussels, uh, even though it's a relatively small city in comparison with the American cities, uh, it can be a real mess in terms of uh, congestion. Um, the fourth one is uh, social inclusiveness. Um, and the fourth one is productivity. Belgium has always been one of the most productive country uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and what we have been uh, witnessing over the last few years is that this productivity gap that we had over France, over Germany, over the Netherlands um, is still positive, but it's becoming uh, smaller and smaller. So it's, it's very important to, to, to keep that uh, competitive uh, edge. Um, this is basically our plan. Uh, each of the small uh, bubble uh, is an investment project. We have 85 uh, investment projects. As you can see, the biggest share uh, of projects are on sustainability. Uh, one, uh, so we have 5.9 billion uh, grants from the EU um, and, 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 and most of it is sustainability and, and mobility. Uh, and so when so in 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 sort of american political terms when we when you say sustainability we should think of that as as climate policy in a way yeah mobility yeah. we would call infrastructure you know the the, the highways yeah. rail, rail those kinds of things exactly yeah. i will yeah. i will i will just deep dive uh, yeah, in yeah. a minute on the project so if we look at sustainability indeed uh, what do we have in sustainability is basically projects that can cut uh, carbon emissions so we have massive program of uh, renovation of buildings to make them more uh, energy efficient public buildings but also private buildings 
We have actually a lot of investment in uh, what we call emerging energy technologies. So investment in, in, in carbon capture uh, infrastructure, uh, transport of uh, hydrogen, and we have some projects on, on climate and environment, uh, building new national parks. Uh, uh, you know that part of Belgium, just as the Netherlands, is below the level of, of the sea. And so we need to anticipate those uh, changes on the, on the water uh, uh, management network. Uh, on mobility, indeed, um, it's uh, in infrastructure mobility, uh, greening road transport is essentially building a charging station to make sure that we can electrify uh, the cars. Um, a lot of uh, projects uh, are on the cycling and walking oh, wow. uh, infrastructure to make sure that we, uh, especially in Brussels and in Antwerp, we, we get much more fluidity um, in the, the transport with uh, bicycles, uh, building highways for bicycles. So next to the highways for cars, you build highways for, for, for bicycles. It's very uh, efficient. And then yeah, this, so this is a lot of U.S. cities have that on some level as a priority, but it's still yeah. pretty stunning to see more money going to, uh, to, to, to biking and, and walking infrastructure than to uh, basically the electric vehicle uh, infrastructure. Right? That, that in, if you look at the, at the Biden proposals that were released over the past month, it really right, they, electric vehicles get two orders of magnitude more money than then then they then you could even conceivably allocate to to biking and walking infrastructure so that really is a pretty remarkable difference i think that's i mean part of it is of course belgium is much more urbanized in a way than the us is uh mm -hmm. but but that's still pretty stunning to see but sorry but go ahead yeah but the americans have a have a, have a particular love story with their cars i mean for sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then uh, modal shift is basically infrastructure is basically um, uh, rail infrastructure so in Belgium, we have one of the most uh, dense uh, network, uh, rail, rail, railway network. And so we will continue to invest uh, in this railway network and not only for passengers, but also uh, for freight. And for example, the port of Antwerp is, is one of the biggest ports um, in, uh, in, in Europe. And now the challenge is, is really how can we do the model shift between what's being transported by truck to, to what's being transported by uh, rail. In terms of digital, I will go very quickly. We have some programs with uh, the defense and the national security on cybersecurity. We have a huge development of uh, optic fiber uh, done with uh, telco companies, uh, pilots of uh, 5G and big public administration uh, digitalization program, especially on the justice uh, system. Is, um, is cybersecurity an area where, where further European integration is being consider to do that i mean completely you're completely right stan i mean if you if you want to be meaningful in what you do in terms of cyber security you need to have a scale and for a very small country like belgium uh, what you can do at a national level is quite limited that's why i, I mean but it's difficult of course because on some level it's part of you know national defense national security which is no but i mean it's it's it, you know there are a lot of discussion on on, on european defense european yeah. cyber security but definitely is one of the areas if you want to i mean be significant in comparison with what the chinese are doing what the americans are doing you need to to, to pull the resources and and to work together i mean what can you do in belgium we put like a bit uh, less than uh, 100 million of public funding uh, with a leverage of two three with the private sector in cyber security it's a lot of money but it's it's, it's significant with the level of the threats that 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 you have on your on your economy, um, uh, and then just to, to, to close it up in terms of inclusiveness, what we have is a social infrastructure, so building um, uh, uh, childcare uh, systems, uh, infrastructure, uh, working on digitalization of the schools, uh, and then we have uh, also some programs on productivity. Um, especially on, 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 on research areas and, and, and training uh, programs on the labor market. So this is a, a quick snapshot. And, 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 and so if you want to get oh, a nice. slide a vision of, of the distribution in, in, in the different regions, so you know that in Belgium, we have a federal government, which gets roughly, percent, uh, roughly uh, 20, 22 percent of the total amount. And then we have Flanders, which is uh, the biggest region uh, in the north, 2 billion. Uh, Wallonia, the French speaking region, 25%. Uh, and then the reminder for uh, the Brussels region.
Here we go. I see. I see. And so how, so we, we can, I think this is something that is, it's probably as relevant in Belgium as it is in the US. So how, how does this work? So you, right. So you, uh, the federal government, the, the, the federal government proposes projects to the commission, but presumably with input from the regions where they, where they have uh, their authorities and their responsibilities. How did, how did that process work? Because of course, in the, in the, in the US, in, in, in some sense, it's very unidirectional, right? The federal government decides to do things. And then in many, on many occasions, the states just decide to take it or not to take it. It's been uh, really the story of, for example, the, the US healthcare system where, uh, you know, the federal government can propose expansions and send money to states. But, you know, in, for the Medicaid program, which is the healthcare program for low income folks, a lot of states have just said, no, we're fine, even though you're going to you're going to spend you're going to pay for 90 percent of the projects. We're not going to do that. So how does that coordination work in in Belgium? Is it does the does the Flemish government get to decide what projects to put into the plan for uh, for areas in which they have responsibility? How how did how did that work? Yeah, so so, so the Belgium institutional system is 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 very specific because you don't have. Uh, it's it's maybe good if you tell people in in a couple of minutes how. Yes, so how we this have works. Uh, we have two three regions: uh, Flanders in the north, uh, Brussels in the center. Uh, so Flanders is uh, they speak Dutch. Uh, Brussels is bilingual region, French Dutch, and then you have the southern part, which is uh, French speaking. Uh, you may have guessed from my accent that I'm from the French-speaking side of the of the country, um, and, and basically, what's very specific about our federalism is that you have no uh, hierarchy of norm, meaning that one level is not superior to the other one. Basically, the federal level is not superior from a legal perspective to uh, the regional level, which makes it uh, very complex to coordinate. So, what we've done uh, basically. Um, is um, so the EU has an experience with the Belgian with the Belgian people trying to make plans, which is basically doing something what we call à la Belge, is you submit a plan which consists of four chapter, one chapter for each region and one chapter for the federal level, with the big problem that it lacks uh, consistency and coherence, especially if you want to address uh, challenges that are completely transversal, such as mobility, deployment on the of infrastructure, etc. So what we've done is, 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 is to follow a very uh, interesting process. First, we, 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 we sat all together around the table and say, okay, what are the priorities? So what are we going to fund? What are we going not to uh, fund? <coughs> Based on this, we, we, we've run massive call for projects around the countries, but along those uh, sets of uh, priorities, and then we, we, we made an apart negotiation on, on how do we split the, the envelope uh, that we received from Europe between the different uh, uh, regions. And so in doing so, we were able to have some kind of coherence, um, but uh, each of the region uh, and each government had uh, some kind of autonomy uh, in the way it can allocate and select the specific projects uh, that would be uh, included in the plan. Interesting. And so, and these, and these, and these projects, how, these projects, what, how should we think of them? Are they, uh, is it typically something that's going to be constructed? Is it subsidy programs? Is it what, how, what, what do they look like? Okay. Uh, maybe I will, I will just use the slides. It would be easier mm -hmm. because I have the impression style, uh, stand that you like the slides with the bubble. Right? They're, so yeah, they're very yeah. pretty. I really liked it when they, when you move them from, uh, from functional yeah. areas to regional uh, spaces. Yeah. That was really nice. I didn't see that coming. Uh, wait. Well, so here you see the, the types of projects we have. Uh, basically, 60% uh, uh, of the plan is infrastructure, whether it's uh, digital infrastructure, I mean, digital fiber, building the new energy networks, uh, renovating buildings, railways, etc. So most of it is infrastructure, which is quite logical uh, if you if you feel the i mean if you conceptually as the need to build infrastructure to decarbonize uh, the, the economy but that's interesting because i so i think based on the previous organization along functional lines right one might get the impression that it's pretty heavy on what you might call industrial policy right whereas here it looks much more like traditional yeah. public investment uh, projects i see yeah yeah no, it's 60% infrastructure. Then uh, you have uh, roughly 15% on uh, R&D programs, 
Uh, and there in Belgium, as a small country, you need to focus on the very specific niche where you can have some kind of international excellence, because otherwise, as a small country, you can't uh, run the risk of spreading yourself uh, very thin across multiple areas. Um, then you have 20, uh, 25, 20, 30 percent in human capital. So basically uh, trainings, uh, building capabilities in the workforce. And the reminder is uh, ICT and, and, and the digitization programs. So this is the type of program you'll find in our, in our plan. I see. And I see. OK, well, good. So I have, I have a question that we might as well ask now from uh, from the audience. The question is, what is the so we, we you talked briefly about moving more transportation onto rail. And so the question is, what is the EU doing more broadly to push freight, uh, to push freight, to push transportation, to push moving goods uh, toward more green modes of transportation? Is that, because that seems like it fits multiple elements of the plan here. So if you, if you, if you, if you can talk about that for a bit, that we, I think appreciate it. I know completely. I mean, it's, it's a big, I mean, if you, if you, if you think strategically on, on, on what are the most impactful ways to, to reduce carbon emissions while minimizing the, um, uh, I would say the, the unhappiness of the, of the, of the citizens, uh, typically uh, increasing the share of goods transported by rail is, is a good thing to invest in. So uh, in Belgium, we have of course, uh, coordination in between the different regions, but you have also at the European level, a coordination between the different uh, uh, member states on specific topics. Uh, rail freight is, is a topic because you need to think of, uh, of it as a, as a cross-border uh, initiative. And so typically uh, the AU has a, a, a broader infrastructure plan on, on building corridors uh, in Europe uh, and, and it's basically highways for uh, freight transport, uh, but in the rail uh, infrastructure. And, and, and definitely the, um, the RRF, so the recovery funds, will be used, at least in Belgium, it will be the case to, to fund those corridors and to make sure that this roadmap, which is a 20 year uh, roadmap, will be uh, faster implemented, thanks to the way that actually we've realized in this crisis that we need to invest further in our. Uh, in our invest in our infrastructure. I see. Well, good. So I, I think the the sort of last block of of topics I wanted to talk about are more on the implementation side. We talked a bit about coordination, of course, at the European level and and within Belgium. But so what is, what does the process look like from here on out? So you submitted the plan to the Commission, then there's going to be an approval process of some kind. What, will there be ongoing monitoring? How does this how does this work? What happens when the projects are done? Is there going to be a, ne a next round of uh, of similar funding? How what do you how do you see that? Well, you must differentiate the, the European level and the, and the national level. At the, at the European level, so we have uh, the formal deadline was uh, April thirty, um, and so we submitted uh, on April thirty alongside with uh, seventeen other uh, member states. So roughly two thirds of the member states have been able to comply with the deadline. Um, then the commission has two months to review the plans. Um, and I must say that it's a big difference. I, I, I've lived and I've worked in the US, I've lived and I've worked in, in, in Europe and, and, and the administrative burden, I mean, it's, it's in the culture of, 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 the, of, the, of the commission also because they need to be extremely uh, detailed because of the reporting structure to the different member states. But it's, it's, it's a very heavy uh, process from an administrative uh, perspective. And so we've been having uh, ongoing discussions uh, over the last uh, over the last months and, and this will continue to happen in the in the next two months the objective is to um, uh, this summer uh, get to a point where the european council uh, can position itself uh, on the on the on the member on the member state uh, plans and, and and the defining criteria will will really be the quality of the project but also the equilibrium and the balance between the, the, the reforms uh, that are in the, the semester, the European semester framework, and uh, the quality of the, of the projects. And so the idea is that the, uh, the first project will be uh, executed as of uh, fall this year, uh, and that the funding will be available to the member states uh, as of uh, this uh, summer. Um, and um, 
Yeah, that's the, that, that's the, that's the plan. At the national level, um, now the question, especially if we look at the size of the of the stimulus of uh, Joe Biden, uh, uh, there is a growing awareness that we need to do more. Uh, and that all of the money will not come from the EU, but that the member states need to commit uh, extra resources. Uh, so this discussion is, is happening uh, uh, in many uh, member states, uh, but in Belgium also. So we are already planning the next uh, envelope of, of investment that we will be able to, to, to commit to at the Belgian level. And so how, how is that going to work? Because I assume a lot of national budgets are in pretty bad shape at some point. I imagine there will be an attempt to go back to uh, fiscal compact type rules. Uh, so is there is there the kind of fiscal space that Biden is counting on? Uh, in, well, no, 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 in, indeed. I mean, there, there are, so now the rules of the fiscal compact and, and the have been waived, yeah. Yeah. have been waived since, uh, to, till 2023. And, and, and honestly, um, and it's very funny because we have had, uh, I mean, People in Europe have the impression that America, uh, the US, are much more liberal and and, and cap, I mean, it's a uh, rule-based economy. Um, but in the end, uh, what liberal have, in the classical liberal sense? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and 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 what we have observed is actually that people have learned from the reaction uh, from the twenty uh, from the twenty oh eight crisis, and that actually the response of the US has been much more uh, okay. Let's react to this crisis by investing with the uh, Obama Recovery Act and so on and so on. What we've done in Europe is exactly the opposite, is imposing austerity measures for a few years, which has led to a deepening of the crisis and so on and so on. We know the story. And now in Europe, you you, you have this kind of, of growing consciousness that actually we need to do uh, more for the recovery strategy. Otherwise, we will pay for a crisis for the next five to 10 years. So. Uh, that's what I would say uh, the, the dominant uh, thinking process currently in Europe is, okay, let's make sure that we do enough for the recovery because the short-term risk of not doing enough for the recovery is higher than the short-term uh, budgetary risk. No, of course, the, the big discussion is going to be, okay, how to revise the rule of the fiscal compact and how can we make sure that we, uh, I mean, we have some kind of, of, of budgetary discipline, but we uh, avoid some kind of, um, I would say, adverse effect of the current rules of the of the of the of the of the stability pact, which basically leads to a, a significant reduction of public investment that we have witnessed across uh, all member states over the last 20 years. Um, and I believe that uh, if there is only one thing that we will uh, positive that we will get out of the crisis is is this reflection on the criteria of the stability pact and how it will be, how it will be revised and so so similarly of course on the on the european level you could say there's uh, there is more fiscal space now than 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 we would have we would have guessed 5 years ago do you and and you can really see that from the fact that i don't think the financing of the of the Recovery facility of next gen EU is clear for now at all. Do you have a sense of where that will, where that will go? Because the where the money that's going to be disbursed, right? There, presumably at some point, the, the there will be uh, loans that have to be have to be paid back, uh, or bonds that have been issued by the European that by the European Union that need to be paid back. Where is that? How is that funding going to work? Do you do you have a good sense of that? Well, it's still it's still um, it's still um, very much uh, uh, unclear at this stage. I mean, especially uh, given the the, the the monetary policy of the ECB that will need to be uh, uh, that will need to be followed closely in in, in, in the next uh, uh, few years. And that's the reason I was I was saying uh, that's an Hamiltonian moment for uh, Europe is 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 whether. How will be the, um, the, the the relationship in the in the union uh, two years down the road, and and, and actually, uh, will it be a call for further uh, uh, fiscal and 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 and, and, and cross national integration, or, or on the opposite, will it be the basis for a European disintegration? That's that's actually the the, the big question and and the big uh, the big uh, defining moment that we that we're going through. I see. I have a question from Mark Horton, who's at the at the IMF, uh, on a on, a, on the conditionality issues we talked about earlier. So he, he says, uh, Mr. Damien stated that there were important reforms on which the disbursement of EU funding would be conditioned. What are these reforms for Belgium? 
tax reforms, labor market reforms, product market reforms. Can you can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. Okay. So, so, the, so the reforms actually are uh, public. It's the reforms that the um, that the Commission is issuing to each member state uh, within the framework of the European semester. If I look at Belgium, I would say there are um, uh, essentially three types of reforms. Um, the first one is um, some uh, regulatory framework for new technologies, for example, for 5G, for uh, hydrogen, carbon capture. Uh, we need to pass specific uh, legislation in order to have a coherent framework in between member states. The second types of reforms are fiscal reforms. And, and for example, in Belgium, we have very specific fiscal schemes for uh, company cars. Uh, we have uh, some very specific fiscal uh, schemes on, on some aspect of uh, labor taxation that we need to, um, to ramp down. Um, this is the second aspect. And then the third aspect is, I would say, more structural reforms uh, on the pension side and how to cope with the uh, increasing cost of, of the pension system given the, the, given the demography. Uh, and that's the type of reform we need to pass. Uh, the difficulty is that we don't, I mean, we are at the very beginning of, of a new government. The government was formed six months ago in October 2020. So we, we've taken a very strong commitment uh, in our government agreements and, and towards the European Union in our uh, recovery plan to pass those reforms. But it's a commitment on the roadmap without, uh, I mean, having the, the specific parameters of the, of the reform that we still need to work on in the, in the coming months. I see. So I, I we're we're getting close to the end of our uh, of our uh, session here. One thing I wanted to ask you, and I mean, obviously you have no incentive to give me a true answer uh, to this question, but uh, if you if you look at the at the reform plan as it exists now, how much of what's in there are things that Belgium would have done anyway uh, if it were if, you know even in the absence of the recovery facility. How many? To what extent are your policies really being guided by the priorities set there? Um, do you have a? Are you? Are you? Do you have? Do you have a clear sense of that? Do you? I would are you worried you're going to lose the funding if you tell them that it's all stuff you wanted to do anyway? No, 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 no. no. I would say I would differentiate on 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 the investment side. On the investment side, uh, there is a tension between indeed the the the, the additionality that you need to have. Uh, and the other criteria imposed by the commission is that all the projects need to be executed by the end of 2026. So you have a tension between, okay, I need to come up with new projects because I need this element of additionality, but on the other, at the same time, I need to get projects that can be executed very fast. And, and you know that for big infrastructure projects, it's projects that you need to think uh, 10 years ahead, et cetera. So, so that's for the investment side. And that's the reason why the additionality criteria is a bit going against the criteria of having a very fast delivery of the infrastructure project. And, and that has been a challenge that has been discussed uh, with the commission. On the reforms, um, I would say, uh, I've, I, I mean, I contributed to the uh, agreement of the government in, in, in Belgium. And indeed, one of the, the, the things that we have in mind at the very uh, top of our mind is the, the, the recommendation of the commission when we, when we draft uh, um, a government agreement. Um, so we would have uh, work on some of the reform, maybe not all the reform, but definitely the fact that we need to put those reform in the recovery plan is an additional incentive to, to pass those reforms within the end of the legislature. And I would say it, it increases further the, 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 the pressure to, to do those reforms. And actually it can be good because you know where it goes in politics. If you have an external body putting pressure on you, uh, it can help, especially to pass uh, different reforms. Never let a crisis go to waste, as they as they say. Exactly. The um, so uh, I, I think th those are uh, most of my questions. I wanted to give you the opportunity if there's anything uh, you think our audience should know. Any 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 closing remarks you have uh, now would be the moment. And no, I think it's um, it's what will be very important to 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 monitor uh, is is really what will be the long lasting Im impact of, of this crisis on the process of, of European integration. We've seen some tension uh, previous to the coronavirus crisis and, and this can be, uh, this can go both ways. It, it can be a, a catalyst for further integration in the European Union. Uh, and I hope really uh, it will be, but it can be also an additional source of discord between the member states uh, if, if the process doesn't go well. 
Uh, and so it will be very uh, important to monitor in the, and, and I'm very curious to, to, to witness what will happen uh, in the next few uh, months and years. So am I, so am I. All right, well, Thomas, thank you uh, so much. And um, everyone, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much and have a great day.